Hello, everyone. Mark Decode here with a special announcement before we get to the podcast. First of all, I want to thank everybody who followed through with my announcement last week and help nominate Resourceful Designer for a podcast award. Now, in case you didn't hear the special announcement on last week's episode, maybe you didn't listen to it, or maybe this is the first time you're tuning in. Resourceful Designer is in consideration for a podcast award this year. I was a finalist last year in 2016, and I would love another chance at the award this year. But I need your help to get on the ballot. This is a voting process by listeners. So I would love it if you visited resourcefuldesigner.com slash podcast awards and nominate Resourceful Designer in the arts category. Now, Resourceful Designer is also listed under People's Choice, and feel free to select it there if you'd like as well. But really, it's the arts category that I'm going for. I would love to win in that category. Now, there are other categories. You can choose whatever shows you like from those categories or just leave them blank. But remember, once you submit your nomination in this particular category, you cannot change it afterwards. You only get one chance to nominate a show. Now, nominations are open until July 31st. So I thank you in advance for your support in nominating Resourceful Designer for a People's Choice Podcast Award, and we'll keep our fingers crossed. And now, on with the show. Resourceful Designer, Episode 80. Explain why, not how. Welcome to the Resourceful Designer Podcast, offering solutions to streamline your graphic and web design business so you can get back to designing. And now, your host, he likes peanut butter and banana sandwiches, Mark DeCote. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for taking your time today to listen to me as we discuss running a graphic design business. Now, I'm going to keep this episode a little bit short this week because I'm a little pressed on time. And that's why I chose today's topic of explain why, not how. But before I get to that, I just want to share a little bit of my past week and have to tell you that I am kicking myself. Earlier this week, I actually missed a deadline for a project for a client. And I don't remember the last time. It's been years that I have actually missed a deadline for it. And I don't even remember the last time. But earlier this week, I had, I'm working on some newspaper ads for a client. I have a whole bunch of newspaper ads to do that are going in probably 20 or so different newspapers around the area for an event coming up. And I wrote down, I have all different deadlines for the different newspapers. And I made a mistake and I didn't realize it till it was too late that I wrote down the deadline. I had to submit the ad to the newspaper, but that was actually the, uh, the date I wrote down was actually the date the newspaper was being published. And I I went back, I said, no, there must be an error. The client gave me the wrong date. I went back and checked the email and no, sure enough, the client told me what day the ad had to be submitted, but in the same email said it would have to be submitted by this date for publication on that date. And that's the date I wrote down in my to-do list. Now, this, this is a case of the clients already approved the ad and now I'm just resizing and reformatting the ad for different publications and The clients, we've been doing this for years and years. So the client doesn't need to approve every single ad because it's the exact same content, just resized. And I know that's a little bit risky, but as I said, we've been doing this for years and this is a good client, but I can't believe she she emailed me and said, uh, this paper just came out today and I don't see the ad in it. And I says, well, what do you mean? This date's just today to submit it. And she goes, no, that it should have been submitted a few days ago for today's publication. Anyways. As I said, I can kick myself for missing that one. No, it's not a big deal. The event is still not for several weeks. So the paper said that they'll just publish it in next week's episode. It's, it's a weekly paper. So they'll publish it in next week's paper instead. So it's not that big a deal, but still, I can't believe that I messed that. And, and it was my mistake because I wrote the date wrong. She gave me the proper date and I wrote it wrong. But anyways, just goes to show that it doesn't matter how long you're in the business, you could still mess up. Now, I don't want you to mess up. And that's why this week's resource is my four-week marketing boost. What is my four-week marketing boost, you ask? I put together this short guide with 20 small tasks for you to do that take about 15 to 30 minutes. You do them one per day over the course of four weeks. And this will improve. It's geared for your website and for overall, but mostly your website. And it'll improve your 
first impression that you present to potential clients because you only get one chance at a first impression. So why not make it the best it can be? So I put together this four week marketing boost. As I said, it's just a bunch of small little tweaks and updates and things you can do to your website. You can do them all at once if you want, but I broke it out so that it only takes about 15 to 30 minutes per day, five days a week for four weeks. And at the end of four weeks, your website will be in a better position to attract new clients. So if this guide is something you're interested in, please visit marketingboost.net. Or if you are in the USA, you can text marketing boost, all one word, to 44222. Now that only works in the USA. Once again, that's marketing boost, all one word, text to 44222. Or visit marketingboost.net and download your free guide and get started. Now, thank you to everyone who signed up to be a patron of Resourceful Designer. Your contribution is used to support this show and all the expenses involved with it. Now, if you are enjoying the podcast, if you get any value of the podcast, if you think there's any worth in what I'm doing, I would encourage you to support the podcast for as little as $1 a month, less than the cost of a cup of coffee. You too can become a patron of Resourceful Designer. Now to sign up, visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and sign up for, as I said, as little as $1 per month. I would greatly appreciate it. And now, this week's topic, explain why, not how. I came across this idea for a podcast topic after recently going through some Facebook groups and some LinkedIn groups, and if you belong to any of these groups, you know that it's inevitable in every one of these groups at some point, somebody posts a logo, a design, something they did, and they ask for people's opinion, their critiques. And more often than not, they don't give a lot of detail. Most of the time is here's a recent logo I did. What do you think? Or here's a design. What's your opinion? Or any critiques? And these questions are always very vague. And inevitably, somebody in the comments will ask, well, can you give us some details about this? Like, if we're going to critique it, we need to know more about it. Give us some details. And so many times I see the person reply where they should have actually replied or or put it in their initial comment, but they reply with what they did. They'll say, well, I created this logo in Illustrator, or I did this design in InDesign, or I created this poster in Photoshop. And I did this, I decided to do uh, this, these techniques, I use these actions. And um, I watched a tutorial recently on how to accomplish this. So I use that in this area of the, the poster and, and so forth. And all those descriptions and explanations are all well, well said and done, but it doesn't explain why they did it. And that is a big, big concern, especially If you're dealing with clients and not just us in the design community. Now, I'm hoping that the reason these people are explaining the things the way they are explaining is because they're talking to people in the design space, other designers, and that they don't talk the same way to their clients. But I'm thinking back to way back in my college days. I remember first year of college, we started designing things. And as we were going through, we were assigned projects to either design a logo or design a magazine ad or a poster or whatever it was. And at the end of these projects, once the projects were submitted, part of the the whole process was to get in front of the class and give a presentation on what you did for everyone to learn from. Sometimes the teachers that would be presenting, they would be the ones we'd be presenting to, they would invite special guests, either friends or other designers from the area to come in and also critique our work. And I remember one such time we had been assigned to design a logo. We had to, uh, I believe we had to create a fictional company and design a logo to go along with the fictional company. And everybody got up in front of the class and presented our logo to our teacher, as well as this guest, which was a very well-known designer in the area, or or not our area, actually was in Ottawa. He was a a well-known designer in Ottawa, had designed lots of big name companies and and done a lot of good work up there. And he was down to critique our work. And I remember going through the presentations and he would ask questions like, could you explain your your logo or, or what you did? And everybody would explain the techniques they'd used and why they chose certain things. 
and, and how they went about putting it together. And it wasn't till the end. He had let everybody talk about their logos and he would give valuable advice along the way, things that he liked, things that he thought needed improvement on, commenting on techniques that were used, innovations that we had tried. But at the end, once everybody had gone through and presented their work, he started calling people out. And he said he didn't want to do this during because he wanted to see if anybody would get it right. And out of the entire class, there was only two or three people who got it right. Now, thankfully, I was one of them. I was so proud at that moment that I had actually got it right. And what he was asking was, he didn't want to know how we had created the logo. He wanted to know why we had created that logo. Why had we gone with that design? Why had we used those techniques? Why had we chosen those elements? And he said the majority of people in the class had never touched on the why. And that is such a valuable part of presenting a design to somebody because a client doesn't care how you went about doing it. They don't care what techniques you used, what software you used, what innovations, whatever, plugins, what uh, actions, what brushes. They don't care about any of that. What matters to them is why you chose to do those things. And I'll never forget that day, for, for one, because I was so proud that I had actually explained why I had done my things. But the way he explained everything was so valuable. He says, a client, sometimes the explanation is more valuable than the design itself. Now, don't get me wrong. There, there's a lot of people that have a, a mindset that if you have to explain a logo, then the logo is a failure. You shouldn't have to explain something. But... I've seen a lot of clients that just didn't get something or didn't appreciate something until it was explained to them. Now, I remember back when I was working at the print shop, it used to drive me nuts when I would design something that I really liked, I thought was really good for a client. And I'd be working at my desk on whatever project I was currently assigned and, and we always had a whole bunch, so it could be anything. And all of a sudden, one of the managers would come up with a docket. We, were, we call them dockets. That's what every project had its own docket. They would come to the docket and say, oh, such and such a client came in. I showed him the proof. Here, they didn't like this. They'd like this changed. And I'm thinking, well, no, that ruins the entire design if we change that. Why didn't you come get me? And he says, well, we didn't need you. We didn't need you. I just showed it to the client and they didn't like it. And I was so frustrating because I was sitting 20 feet away. You could have come and got me. And I could have explained what my design meant, why I chose to do what I did. Because given the chance, I know that I probably could have convinced the client on the value in the design I chose. So many times over the years have I shown a logo, a design, a layout to a client, and their first impression is uh, they don't like it. But once I start explaining the reason behind why I did what I did, then all of a sudden at the end, they'll tell me that, Mark, you know, I, I didn't like this at first, but after hearing what you said, I see the value in it and, and now I love it. And I've heard that so many times and that really drilled into me the value of explaining why. I remember one particular project I was working on. It was a poster for a, a dog obedience school. And the heading on the poster was, is your dog trained? That was the question, the heading on the poster. And I had done it in a way so that the question mark was a little bit off skew and it had a little bite taken out of it. And I thought like, this is great. You know, this is kind of funny. It, it, it shows that it's asking, is your dog trained? And no, there, the dog must have pulled the question mark off, took a bite out of it, nibbled. And it showed that sort of thing. Well, the client came in and at first when they saw it, I wasn't the one presenting it to them. And when they saw it, they thought, oh, that looks messy. I don't like that and, and such because they didn't understand what I was doing. Now, luckily, this was a time that I actually saw the client come in. So I got up from my desk and I went up to talk to them as they were talking to the manager who was presenting it to them. And after I explained that you, you're trying to get people that, you know, some people might say, yes, my dog's trained. I took him to obedience school or, yeah, my dog sits when I tell it to. But there's a whole lot more to a trained dog than just being able to sit on command. 
And sometimes there might be things like nipping or not letting go of a toy when you tell it to. And I said, that kind of shows a little fun way of, you know, somebody might say, yes, my dog is trained, but they might also do these little annoying habits that they don't know how to stop them. And as I explained that, the client saw the value in what I was doing. Now, just to say, we didn't end up going with that because I also convinced the client that that wasn't a very good heading to use, even though that's what she really wanted was, is your dog trained? And I said, that's too ambiguous. A lot of people say, yes, my dog's trained, but the dog doesn't do anything. So I actually convinced the client to change the heading to, does your dog listen to you? But that's a completely other story. And she loved that. And actually, she said that that actually brought in a lot more business to her because people were saying, yes, I've already trained my dog. We've brought him to obedience school as a a puppy. But he doesn't listen. So when we put out the posters or she put out the posters, it says, does your dog listen to you with a question mark and then explained everything her school does. She said enrollment went up that season because of that. And a lot of people, she told me afterwards, a lot of people enrolled because they thought their dog is trained. The dog just doesn't listen very well. So they went in to train their dog how to listen. But that's a completely other topic on changing the, uh, the marketing message and that. But the the whole fact is the original logo, when I showed her and I explained to her why I had taken a bite out of the question mark and had it askew a little bit, and she saw the value in it. There was a logo that I designed a few years ago for a local client. The name of the company started with the letters L-A-T. And when I put, and they, we were using all caps. So we had the capital L followed by an A, followed by a T. Now, what happened, and and then the rest of the wording. Now, what happened is there was a huge gap at the beginning of the logo because of the way the capital L next to an A, and it left that big open space. And then, of course, with the A and a capital T, you're able to kern them closer together to kind of fill in that gap. So what I decided to do for the logo is the left descender on the A I actually cut it and swung the L, moved the L in closer so that the L actually went under the uh, left leg of the A and almost butt up to the right leg so that it closed in that gap. Now, when I explained that to the client, I could have just said, well, it made it more visually pleasing. Uh, you know, it, it just made sense to do this. And that. But no, I explained to the client that not only does it make it visual, uh, more visually pleasing, because it did. But it also aligned the other letters perfectly and brought more cohesion to the logo. It, it tightened everything up and it gave it more purpose, gave it more focus and structure. And the nature of their business all had to do with structure and things aligning properly. So I said, look at the measurements now, the L, the A, the T, and the rest of the letters, they all align perfectly. And that wouldn't have been accomplished if I hadn't cut the bottom of that left descender on the A and shoved the L underneath it. So explaining why was a big value to the client. And as I said earlier, this is something I'm seeing often in the Facebook and LinkedIn groups when people are asking for critiques, they're not really explaining why they chose to do something. They are most of the time explaining how. Now, going back to my days at the print shop, I remember as well that I was often asked to come sit in when a designer would come in for an interview and do a portfolio presentation. For one, the manager wasn't a designer, so he wanted a designer's perspective during the interview. So he would sometimes have me or one of the other designers sit in on interviews. And I remember these, most of these people were, were either fresh out of school or were still fairly new in the industry. So their portfolios were still very young and still not fully developed, I would say. But oftentimes, they would have the same issue. They were presenting to us for a job, and they were explaining how they had done things. Now, in that context, maybe I can see how it would help because they were explaining that how they did it, the process, so that they we would know that they were familiar with Photoshop, with Illustrator and all the different software that they knew how to use it to manipulate it. But whenever I would ask them, can you explain your reasoning behind it? There were so many times where they didn't know, they didn't have an answer or their answer was, I don't know, I just thought it looked good or I just liked it that way. 
And to a client, that doesn't mean anything. You have to find a reason for everything. Why did you choose the font you chose? Why do you choose the colors that you chose? Just saying that I chose red because I was in a mood for red or, or it's a nice color is not a good enough answer. Now, if the client came to you and said that I want a logo and I want it to be red, then so be it. But if the client said it's completely up to you, then find a reason. Is, did you choose red because of the passion involved with it? Did you choose red because of the urgency? There's a lot of meaning behind color that you can bring into your explanation. The same thing with fonts. Why do you choose a serif font over a sans serif font? Why do you choose italic? Why do you choose bold? If you do one of those logos where, you know, the two words are butt together and one word is in bold, the other one is in a light version of the font. Why did you choose the bold font first and then the light instead of light first and then the bold or vice versa or whatever? Without a good reason why you chose what to do, it's a lot harder to sell something to your clients. And that's one of the reasons why I love presenting stuff in person, because you can't just send an email, here's a proof for the job, and hope to convey everything. Even if you write it all out, first of all, the client's going to look at the job and get their impression. And in all honesty, sometimes they won't even read what you wrote. They're looking at the final piece that they just received. And without a chance to explain things to them, a lot can get lost. And that's why, as I said, I love presenting in person. If I can't present in person, sometimes I'll create a video. I've got ScreenFlow installed on my Mac here, and I'll uh, install a video. Whenever I'm presenting a website, I'll do a video walkthrough of the website, why I chose to do different things and so forth, or do the same thing with a logo. Or sometimes what I'll do is if I'm just going to email the proof to them, I'll send an email to the client and say, the proof is ready. Give me a call when you want to look at it and I'll email it to you and we can discuss things over the phone. And that has worked wonders. They'll call me up and say, Mark, I want to see that proof. Okay. Do you have a few minutes? Let me email it to you right now and then you can open it and we'll discuss it. And the client opens it up for the first time with me on the phone and I could tell him, okay, now look at it here. Do you see this? This is why I did that. You see that element? Is there anything you, you don't quite understand? And they'll say, well, what's this here? Oh, well, the reason that's there is because of, and, and so forth. And all of a sudden, something that the client may have looked at it and says, I don't understand this. I don't like this. And then, of course, what's going to happen is they're going to start showing it around to other people. And the fact that they don't understand or there's something they don't get will be broadcast to those people and those people in turn will start saying the same thing. Well, I don't get it because they just want to go along with the person showing it to them. But if I can present it to them in that way, say, okay, now you see it. And, and if I explain everything and the client still doesn't get it or doesn't like it, then maybe I failed at some part of it and I have to go in and make some changes. And that happens. But again, there has been so many times where the explanation is what actually sells the design. Especially when the client comes to you and says, this is what I want. I want something like this. I want something done this way. I want this sort of layout. And if you don't follow exactly what they, they asked for, you better well have a, uh, an explanation as to why you chose the direction you did. I remember doing a logo for a company that, was a, that they offered coaching and tutorial type services. And the company name was True Nobility. And they told me, because of the nature of their business, they wanted a tree to represent the tree of knowledge. And I was thinking, oh, that's so cliche. There's so many things when you think knowledge, you so many places they'll use the tree. So what I did is I decided to do more of a word mark for them. And I put true nobility. Again, I put the, the no spacing between them. I put them together. But I had the T and the N. I chose a different font. And the N I, in, that ended up in the middle, because I had true on the left, the nobility, the N that was in the middle, I made it a, a bigger letter than the rest. And the, the right ascender on the N had a big flourish that arced over the rest of the word to the end of the word. And all I did was at the end of that ascender or of that arc, I added an oak leaf and an acorn hanging off the end of it. So they got their tree idea without having to put a tree in there. And when I explained that, that 
it, it's True Nobility was the name of the company and how I use such a classy type font that really showed the maturity and the sophistication of the company. But I still covered the whole knowledge aspect of the company by simply including an oak leaf and an acorn instead of the entire tree. And the client loved it. It was the explanation when I told them everything. They said, you know, this is not something we ever had in mind. We, we never would have thought of something like this, but we absolutely love it. And that's what they decided to go with. And again, it all came down to presentation and explaining why I did what I did. I don't know if I had just sent them that logo and said, here's a logo. They might have just come back and go, that's not at all what we asked for. We asked for something with a tree in it. But no, I explained it to them. And that explanation helped them choose that logo. You got to remember that it's the final results that matter. What the design will bring to the client, what the design will accomplish. It's not the journey that it took to get there. It's not the method you use to design it that matters. It's the same thing whenever I say that the tools don't make the designer. It's the designer that makes the designer. Because you could design something in Photoshop. You can design something in Illustrator. Heck, you can design something in Microsoft Paint. If you do a good job, now don't, please don't go design something in Microsoft Paint. But I'm just saying, if you do a good job and you could explain why you did what you did, it doesn't matter how you accomplished it. It's the why that matters. And that's why I chose today's topic. Explain why and not how. And I hope that anybody out there, especially the new people getting into this industry, those that have been around for a while, hopefully will have caught on to this and, and know this. But it's the newer people, especially when I see in the Facebook and the LinkedIn groups, these newer people are just getting into design and they don't understand why they did something. They, all they know is, oh, it looks cool. Well, just because it looks cool is not really a selling factor. Because I can design a logo that looks cool, but if there's no purpose, if there's no reason behind why I made it look cool, then it's just an ornament and really will not bring the value the client is paying you for. So I would love to know how you present to clients. Do you explain why you chose what you did, the reasoning behind your choices, the reasoning behind your layout, the reasoning behind your color? Leave me a comment on the show note page for this episode at resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 80. I would love to hear from you. And now, this week's question of the week. And this week's question comes in from Jordan. It says, I was wondering what type of content I can post for my business on social media. I've started creating blog posts, but I know brands are about 70% content and 30% selling when it comes to social media. If you're a potato chip company, for example... You can post a picture of your potato chips and say, have a great summer with Acme potato chips. If you're a music entertainment company, you can post, it's Miley Cyrus's birthday today. Happy birthday, Miley. But I'm at a loss for what content would be valuable to clients of graphic design web development business and not just targeting other graphic designers, developers, and creatives who aren't my clientele. Well, thank you for your question, Jordan. Now, this is actually pretty easy to answer. You got to remember that as designers, we are problem solvers. If you look at it that way, every client that comes to you, they hire you because they have a problem. They don't have a web presence. That's their problem. They need a website. They're starting a new company. What's the problem? They don't have a logo. That's the problem you can solve. And those are, those are bigger ones, but sometimes it could be something simple. I'm getting a lot of spam with my email. What can I do? Well, the pro that's the problem. Your, your email is all over your website. The solution could be adding forms to your website and eliminating the email so that fishers can't grab it from there. So what you need to look at in your social media posts, other than just promoting your own blogs, is what problems does your social media posts address? Think of the things that client, like as you're dealing with your clients on a day-to-day -day basis and you're talking to them or people are coming to you with projects for stuff, Try to think in the back of your mind, what problem is this solving? Because chances are, if that client has a problem, other people have a similar problem. And if you can provide a solution, there's a good chance they come to you for the answer. Now, another thing you can post, Jordan, is I've talked about it before, is the fact that a lot of times your clients don't know what it is you do or everything you do. 
you hear me refer often to episode two of the podcast. This was such an important topic that I made it my second episode after my first. My first episode was introduction to the podcast. And my second episode was do your clients know what you do? And this is such a big problem in our industry because if a client hires you to design a logo, they might not necessarily know you do business cards. They might not know you also design posters, t-shirts, websites, card wraps, trade show booths, whatever it is you offer. Your clients don't know that. They're hiring you for a specific purpose. I remember in that episode talking about how my brother-in-law, who saw me go through school, saw me work at the print shop, saw me start my own business, when I designed a logo for his company, once the logo was completed, he actually asked me who he should go to to have business cards designed. He didn't know that I can also do business cards. In our industry, we just take it for granted that we're a graphic designer. We can do all this stuff. But the majority of people out there don't know what graphic designers do. So in your social media, why not tell people? If you do t-shirt designs, send out some posts about t-shirt designs. If you do posters, send posts about posters. You can either send out posts saying, here's a nice poster I just did, or give advice about posters. Maybe there's a, a local trade show coming up. You can start posting uh, advice or, or things about trade shows. Like what about uh, pop-up banners or posters or vinyl hanging banners or all sorts of other displays, stuff that you can design for them. And just seeing this, when people start noticing these things and they'll go, oh, wow, I didn't know Jordan did that. Or wow, Jordan just posted about this. Well, that's something that my business can use. So why don't I hire him? So those, that opens up a wide vault of different things you can post about in social media. Remember that it always has to come to solving a problem. That's the best thing. Any business, not just design, any business in the world is a problem solver. If you're a business that sells mattresses, you're solving the problem of people having trouble sleeping or getting a good night's sleep or waking up in the morning sore. You're that problem solver. If you sell cars, you're solving the problem of transportation. If you're a plumber, you're solving the problem of leaky faucets or new bathroom or home renovations, all sorts of different things. Well, the same applies to our graphic design. That's what we do. We're problem solvers. Now, other things you can tweet and post and whatever in all the various social medias is talk about trends, analytics. Google came up with something that might affect some websites. Tweet about it. Post about it. Pantone released their new colors for the year. Why don't you mention it to people? You know, let people know what the color trends are for this year. What colors are going to be popular this summer? What colors are going to be popular in 2018 or 19 or 20 or whatever? What colors are no longer popular? That might be a good one. If, if Pantone or, or you see somewhere that these colors are, are considered cliche or in the out, well, maybe you have clients that those are their corporate colors. And when they start seeing that, the people are, are not associating well with those colors anymore, they might decide to rebrand and hire you. You could also talk about innovations or innovative ideas. If you see something online, let's say you're perusing some Facebook group or, or some message board or some blog post. And somebody talks about some new design thing that came out or, or some, uh, a new type of media or stock or, or whatever, you can post about that sort of thing because you never know. Posting about different ways to bind books. Maybe there's a client out there, a potential client out there that is thinking of putting a book together or something, a journal or, or a memoir or something. And your post about different ways to bind a book might be all that they need to contact you and say, hey, I saw your post on book bindings. Can you help me? I'm thinking of putting this thing together or whatever. And again, as I said, it all comes down to problem solving, Jordan. So think of it in that sense. What sort of problems are out there and what sort of posts can you put out that will address those problems and possibly provide a solution for the people seeing them that will entice them to contact you? And in the process, you might get other graphic designers and developers and, and creatives that are not your clientele liking them, but the chances are those are also the people that are going to start forwarding them and passing them on. And if you brand them properly, like if you're going to put out a, a post or something, uh, an image of some sort, put your brand on it. So if somebody else sees it, then they see your brand. Because without it, if you post something and then I turn around and forward it, and it's a great problem solver. 
somebody might say, hey, Mark, I saw this thing you forwarded. Can I talk to you about doing that? But if you put your brand on the social media, they might say, oh, well, Mark forwarded this, but here's the brand. Here's Jordan. I'll just contact Jordan directly because he's the one that originally posted it. So anyways, that's the, the short and best answer that I have for your question, Jordan. Think of problems, get them wherever you can from existing clients, from visiting uh, Facebook groups or other social media. Look to see what other people are having issues with and address them in your social media posts and your blog posts. And you'll see that if you can supply an answer, a solution, or any way address those problems, you will see a return on your investment. So thank you very much for that question, Jordan. I do appreciate it. And I hope my answer was satisfactory. Now, if you would like to submit a question for the podcast, because I think Jordan's might be the last question. I might have one or two. I'm going to have to go back through. Uh, I've got my list. I'll have to go back through and see. But I've got very few questions left. So please, if you do have a question you'd like me to answer, please visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash feedback, and you can fill out the form submitting your question, and I will consider it for a future episode of the podcast. Now, before I go, I'd love to share another iTunes review with you. This one comes in from Luke B3 in the USA. He says, very insightful. The Resourceful Designer podcast is an amazing resource for anyone who wants to run their own design business. I'm currently in the process of starting my own web design business, and I learn something new in every episode. The host, Mark Decote, is very easy to listen to and does a great job of presenting his content. Whether you are new to the game or a veteran designer, I recommend that you tune into this podcast. Well, thank you very much for the kind words, Luke B3. I love getting these iTunes reviews. If you haven't done so already and you would like to leave a review, please visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash iTunes, which will redirect you to the iTunes store right to the Resourceful Designer page where you can leave your review. Now, before I sign off, I just want to remind you about this week's resource, which is my four-week marketing boost, an easy-to-follow guide that'll help you create the best first impression you can when potential clients visit you. You can get it by visiting marketingboost.net or in the USA, text Marketing Boost, all one word, to 44222. Thank you very much for listening to the podcast. If you have been enjoying it, please share it with a fellow designer. Help spread the love around. Until next week, I am Mark Decote, wishing you all the best with your graphic design business. And as always, reminding you to stay creative. Thanks for listening to the Resourceful Designer Podcast at resourcefuldesigner.com.